So another view, of course, is some people might take, and I think Claude Steiner did, he was a prodigal son of uh, Eric Byrne, was that uh, once the contract has been achieved, that could be seen as therapeutic cure. Yeah. For example, so people have different versions. Yeah, yeah. But I, I would imagine that most people think that that is the, the therapeutic cure. If they've like put something down on the contract, what they want to get out of therapy, and then that is, is reached and it comes to a conclusion, then that theoretically is therapeutic cure. But I quite like the thing about script. I, I quite like that. Yeah, the idea that once we've you moved away from our script, our dysfunctional script, and put yeah. a new script on the road. Yeah. And there's, you know, that could be seen as therapeutic cure. But... Yes. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 90 of The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. Hello, hello. I always like it when you say a wonderful Bob Cook. You say many different things. I think you said the delicious Bob Cook last time or the time before. Delightful and delicious, yeah. (laughs) It, so, it takes away from all this rain we have. Yes, but anyway, I know. The, the, the weather first, is not good. So, so what, what we're going to be it? talking about in this episode, episode 90, is what 90. do we mean by therapeutic cure? How have we gotten back to 90? I was looking uh, the other day at the number one we did, which yeah. was uh, introducing... Introduction, the, yeah. yeah, many moons yeah, yeah. ago. Uh, many moons ago, and I thought, gosh... I look so youthful then. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's the podcast that's have aged me. <laughs> I, th- I think we're doing really well with these. I know we've mentioned it before, but, you know, a lot of people start podcasts and just don't continue them. So the fact that we're up to episode 90 and that we've still got listeners. We, oh, we, the we, listeners we are going this. up and up and up. Exactly, and up. yeah. Yeah, so whether they prefer to watch it on the video so they can see us or whether they just want to listen to us on the podcast. But yeah, the numbers are increasing, which is brilliant. So a big thank you to everybody out there. Yeah, thank you. So the title is, say it again. The title is What Do We Mean by Therapeutic Cure? Oh gosh, that's a that's a question and a half. It is. Because <laughs> does does cure mean different things for different people? I think so. I mean, you and I were trained originally in our first trainings uh, by Eric, you know, uh, transaction analysis. And Eric Byrne was the originator of the PAC model, that's parent, adult, child, which formed the basis of the concept of transaction analysis. And he, when he talked about cure, and he did quite a lot, um, he talked about different types of cure. So he talked about script cure yeah he talked about psychoanalytical cure he talked about transferential cure that was in 1968 69 up to date of course people when people talk about cure richard erskine talks about cure in different ways and many people talk about cure in many many different facets but i think the question you've just asked is really crucial um around well what you know, is the different types and different meanings of therapy to cure. And I bet your bottom dollar, if we took nine people off the street, uh, they'd all have different versions of what cure might be. Yeah. Let's say Eric Byrne talked about transferential cure, he talked about, I think it was psychoanalytical, psychoanalytical cure, he talked about, so he talked about various lots of cure. Oh, so I could start there. I mean, I think his book... I don't know which book is it. Scripts people. Um, what you say after say hello was his scripts book. Well, I think he talked about script cure. Yeah. And it, what he meant by that was, uh, if we take the term script to mean an unconscious life plan, then he would talk about that once we've um, moved away from our script, 
and put a new script on the road. We have a, a variant of um, um, therapeutic cure. Yeah. So another view, of course, is some people might take, and I think Claude Steiner did, he was a prodigal son of uh, Eric Byrne, was that uh, once the contract has been achieved, that could be seen as therapeutic cure. Yeah. For example, so people have different versions. Yeah, yeah. But I, I would imagine that most people think that that is the, the therapeutic cure. If they've like put something down on the contract, what they want to get out of therapy, and then that is, is reached and it comes to a conclusion, then that theoretically is therapeutic cure. But I quite like the thing about script. I, I quite like that. Yeah, the idea that once we've you moved away from our script, our dysfunctional script, and put yeah. a new script on the road. Yeah. And there's, you know, that could be seen as therapeutic cure. Burton also talked about what he's uh, termed transferential cure. Um, and of course, what he means by that is that people might leave therapy um, having achieved their contract or or achieve their goal, uh, but they're still in transference with the therapist. So it's yeah. been the therapist who's provided the, the therapeutic potency, if you like, or the therapist may still be in their own narrative in the client's head and they feel a lot better. And he yeah. called that transferential cure. Yeah, which we've, we've kind of touched on that topic in, in the past about, you know, the part that, the therapist plays in the cure and you know whether I, I think I was saying about becoming the crutch and we were talking about you know transferable objects and all that sort of stuff yeah well, there's also a transformational cure people talk a lot about today and that's when people have you know in therapy have had some sort of transformation positive yeah. transformation they may see that as therapy to cure which of course has to line in with the contractual process being achieved and that could be called cure yeah so i think people have different versions of what cure means uh for, i do like the idea of script cure richard erskine talked a lot about that the cure for him was i think can't quote him too much because i can't remember when the article was um that once we let go of the dysfunctional life plan that was holding ourselves back yeah. then um we put a new healthy script on the road um that would be called cure if you like yeah yeah because there's some i don't know whether it's because of what i've been through over these past 12 months or not but th i've been thinking a lot about you know we're constantly changing as human beings you know, we, we're evolving all the time and, you know, life events happen and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, I'm curious as to whether there's there's ever just one cure. <laughs> no, that's I, 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 I uh, really agree with you here. That is why when people talk about contracts and contractual theory being so central to transaction analysis, for example, and people come in with a contract and uh, Byrne used to talk about contracts being specific, observable, um, and, you know, it's like often as a person ch deals with or changes or achieves what their focus or contract was, another one may appear. Yeah. So it's a bit like uh, going through the layer of onions. Yeah. When does it ever change? So, yeah. for example, I'm going to probably be, I mean, I've been in a, sort of um, a therapeutic group for a very long time, last 10 or 11 years, that meets twice a year. And I'll probably be ending that soon. Um, and when I look back, and am I ending because I feel cured in a general sense? No, I'm ending because I feel there's the right time to end. I've done a lot of good work where I've achieved certain goals and certain contracts. Am I cured from you know, all the things that have been so challenging to me? Probably not, but I have actually, um, or are able to, to deal with those challenges better. Yeah. I don't stay in the same sort of hole that I used to fall down, I get out quicker. So I'm not sure if we ever get 
in inverted commas, cured yeah. uh, in that sort of all-encompassing way. Yeah. And I think it's good that you shared that, Bob, as well, because, you know, and again, this, this could just be the way that I think about it, but I think sometimes people think that, you know, therapists, counsellors, you, you know, psychotherapists or whatever, have got all their stuff sorted out. <laughs> You know what I mean? That we we don't have issues. We know what to do when something happens, and we've got it all sorted, and life's wonderful. And that's not always the case. We we need support. We need, you know, whether it's supervision or whether it's our own personal therapy, because life happens to us as well. Yes, and and of course, the therapists that don't have their own therapy, or the therapists who believe they've done, I don't know. 20 sessions of therapy and they don't do have to do any more um they're the therapists usually that have that have challenges and run into problems at a clinical level yeah yeah and it's it's about being authentic and and understanding and noticing when when we we do need to take a break or when things are getting too much for us because we can't serve our clients if we're not looking after ourselves. It's that what comes yeah. first, the chicken or the egg type thing. No, it's impossible. And I believe, and you know, many people probably don't believe this, so but that's fine. Um, you know, I, I believe it's ridiculous to. Um, go down the line that BACP go down which says that you don't need to have any therapy at all and you know most of the courses perhaps only demand 20 or 40 hours of therapy in the whole of their three years of training I think that's just um, not right really because it doesn't protect the client it doesn't protect the therapist either I think you need at least a big chunk UKCP says um, basically 160 hours over the four year of training uh, I would go further than that. I, I understand that. I think that's a good chunk. However, I would go further and say, you know, in this job, I've always been triggered by many, many things that clients bring to me. Yeah. And surprisingly, more as I've gone on. So I've always believed in support for myself. And it's really helped me. And I say, I've been in the job 36 five years as a clinician and without the, my own therapy I think the job would have been too difficult for me actually yeah or at least it would have been more challenging to me yeah I, I kind of agree with that yeah I, I, would, I was just wondering when you said about the BACP you, you know and not it's not on the criteria or whatever but yet supervision is do you think that they see supervision as personal therapy <laughs> I have no idea what goes through that regulating body's head. So no, I, I, if I put that in a positive life, I think the major reason is, is because out of there, they've got about 30,000 members in the British Association Counseling for Psychotherapy. And the last time I had this conversation with some of the uh, regulating body of the BAC people, which is probably 20 years ago now, and we we're talking this sort of thing, they said, oh, well, 20,000 of our membership... Um, they, 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 uh, you know, don't need counselling per se uh, because they work, um, they may need some six or seven sessions maybe because they're working in um, a situation in a workplace where they just use some of their counselling skills so they don't need to have in-depth counselling or in-depth therapy. Right. You know, they're sort of counsellors in the workplace that would offer six sessions or something. Yeah, which is different to psychotherapy, and yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The problem is, of course, that might be the case for a large amount of the BACP, but for the all the others that uh, are counsellors or therapists, listen to this, who may see uh, clients for six months, eight months, ten months, a year, two years, three years, um, we've got a different ball game. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do I do think it is important that we we take care of ourselves. No, I couldn't agree more. So when we talk about cure, you know, as you reflect on cure for you, you know, in terms of you've been working clinically for a long time, how do you see cure personally and professionally? 
it, it, it kind of like what I touched on. I do see cure as when, you know, the contract has come to its conclusion and the, the client has achieved whatever it was that they set out to achieve in it. But it's it's like a, on a loop. Do you know what I mean? Once they've achieved that, is there going to be something else that they want to achieve that then starts to cycle off again? So I'm not sure whether we ever actually get to what I don't even know what cure is in a, in a, in a therapeutic sense, to be perfectly honest, Bob. Usually, I think it's like dominoes. If yeah. we dislodge one domino, you know, we may actually dislodge another one. Yeah, yeah. When we dislodge another one, we can often dislodge another one. Yeah. So as people come achieve contractually usually in my experience other things get dislodged and yeah. then there's another contract or another focus and and that's how it goes and this has kind of just triggered something else for me you know i've been on lots of different training courses I, you know i've done um nlp and a bit of hypnotherapy and a bit of all sorts of stuff and one of the the criticisms that i hear an awful lot about therapy is that it's never ending it's always ongoing you know whereas counsellors it might be a six or eight week sessions or, or you know with hypnotherapy it's two sessions and then everything's fine and it's that's to me is exactly the reason because we're constantly evolving and we sort one thing out and then there's something else and it's it's kind of like people want to rush through it and get to the end and be cured and I don't know whether we that's ever possible <laughs> when life happens and we change and we evolve and we grow up and we go from being single to married to a mum or a dad or and then we grieve and it, 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 shit happens, Bob. <laughs> yeah, it depends what you mean by cure again. I mean, if we mean complete, complete cure of all our ills, wards, of all and... suffering, yeah, <laughs> then, um then it's that's a life's journey i think yeah um if we just come in and say something like well i i i'm depressed and i want to be more relaxed and maybe you know i don't know eight months time we're able to be more relaxed yeah we can handle the depression in a more healthy way that's more specified cure yeah. if you like yeah um but in terms of all the things i've just said this overall arching aspect of cure i think is a life long journey yeah i agree but that's not to say like you said that you know the, the specific cure we can't go on in life and be better able to cope with what life throws at us you know every step of the way we, we you know we're pointed in the right direction and we're going to be getting you know more well as we go along but yeah i i wouldn't like to say that I've been cured yet. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> when I look back at, I say, my professional and personal life, I mean, I went, uh, the beginning was personal therapy, and I've had quite a bit of therapy. And I would say that my life, or I changed my life, whichever way you want to look at this, dramatically um, in many different ways through therapy. And that doesn't mean I will go to my, you know, grave saying that I've been cured. I would mm -hmm. go say there's been, through therapy, there's been a positive, positive transformation. Yeah. And life was much more beneficial for me. Yeah. Do I still have vulnerabilities? Do I do still have difficult times? Yes. Can I handle it better? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I I totally agree. I kind of feel the same way now. If if I get in a funk, you know, if something happens, I don't stay in it as long as what I used to do. You mm. know, it would be weeks, weeks and weeks I could hold on to something. Whereas now I kind of am more aware of my triggers and how I respond and react to things. And I can move out of my scripted stuff a lot quicker. But I still go in it. I still get caught up in it now and then. Yeah. So I think there's a difference between long-term psychotherapy, medium therapy, if you want, and short-term therapy. Yeah. So it's fine if somebody wants to come to therapy and deal with their uh, something specific 
and that might only take three months, six months. Yeah. They, it's fine if they go on and deal with other things that have been dislodged in the process. And it's also fine if they leave as well, having cured that aspect, say agoraphobia. Or yeah, yeah. Whatever it is specifically. Uh, usually in my experience, people change to a degree where they'd be able to cope with certain aspects of life better uh and more healthily and they might call that cool yeah and i i i don't think there's any other place where you get the same that you do in a therapy room you it, yeah, you can you can talk to your friends and you can talk to your family. You can get support and everything, but to get you know non judgmental, safe space and everything, I think everybody should have therapy as a matter of course all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, the economic situation with lots of people hinders that. But I, in an ideal world, I completely agree with you. And you know, um, when I hear about people who say, well, I was in therapy and I went in therapy because of my obsessions and um, I now understand where those obsessions came from. I understand the function of those obsessions and I can deal with it in a more peaceful manner or those demons don't attack me so much. I think that's cure. Yeah. Yeah. Therapeutic cure, isn't it? In my head. Yeah. And like and I, I said at the beginning, it, it's it's what is cure for that person. And if that person is okay with the level that they're at, then that is cure. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. And I think the, I think the the therapist has a big part in this, in the sense of, um, which is another podcast again, perhaps, but we'll bring it into this one. And that is in in inverted commas, letting the client go. Yeah. Because that's the, there's something we can talk about in this aspect, and that is the the therapist who, um, for whatever reasons, might need the client to stay in therapy to meet their own needs, or um, well, let's just leave it there. And so the the the, the um, client stays too long in therapy, if you want to put it that way. Um, and so I think the therapist needs to actually. Uh, with the client have focus um, perhaps have a bilateral contract where they both agree and they both discuss endings transitions to endings yeah and the therapist might often give permission if you want to put that term um, for the the client to move on yeah yeah do you think it's important for clients, you know, once they've moved on to, you know, if they wanted to come back to therapy to try another therapist? I thought you were going to say something there and completely. I thought you were going to say, is it okay for the client to come back occasionally? And I was in my head then going to talk about maintenance contracts. Where yes, some yes. people come back because, you know, they feel they wanted some support to be able to, you know, uh, get on with life or to be able to just come back and have some support in the changes they're making, which I call maintenance contracts. So would you say a maintenance contract is kind of like coming back once a month or yes. once a couple of months rather That's than exactly regularly right. every once week? Yeah, yeah. Twice a year or whatever it is. Yeah. I think there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, but you didn't ask me that question. No. You have to be another one. So what was the other one you asked me? Just whether you would ever advise a client if they had a break and then came back to you to to try a different therapist. Oh gosh! Because we all we oh. all therapize differently, I would imagine. Yes, we've got the same basic training, but the way we are in the therapy room is well, to yeah, work. I can answer that one. I've certainly done it in assessments where you know a person that I have passed on to a therapist. And then they come back to you three years later and I say, how did you get on with that therapist? They said, really good. And um, and then we have a discussion about whether they want to go on to another therapist or go back to the original therapist. So I have certainly have pointed different directions there. However, if you talk about personally with me, um, has a client come back to me and said, and I've said, you know, 
we could continue XXX or I could point to somewhere else. No, I never have. Do I think it's okay to do that? Yes, because I don't think that there's any absolutes in psychotherapists. The psychotherapy, they don't think there's an absolute right way or wrong way to do therapy. So would have I had conversations about going to a different therapist? Yes. Has it has it happened? No. <laughs> so it's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot, there's a lot in that question, you know, like how come somebody comes back to you in the first place? Uh, you know, what are they projecting on you and what do they expect you to answer? Uh, we talk a long way about that. So in the main, when people come back to me, they come back to me because they want to be with me. Yeah, yeah. They want a sense of continuity and they're, they're, they had good service last time and uh, all these things. They don't come back and then say, well, perhaps I need another therapist. Could you recommend one yeah I think it's been mentioned to me in the past and one of the things that you know clients will say is I don't want to have to go through it all again with somebody new yeah that's very you know, common. they kind of want to start off where they are now going forward rather than having to go back and, and revisit certain things that they've already worked through yeah oh, absolutely that's very very common sentence um and I usually say, so especially in the assessment processes, well, you don't have to start again with someone new if you don't want to. Have yeah. you ever thought about ringing them up? Yeah. So uh, it's going to help us another whole podcast, but it is an interesting discussion. As for cure, I think cure in the end is up to the client, how they see cure rather than how the therapists see cure. Yeah. I mean, the therapists uh, can talk about how they see cure and there can be a bilateral discussion but in the end it's that's up to the remit for the client i think yeah and we need to support them in whatever that decision is when they reach a conclusion to it yeah like you say it's, it's not it's not down to us to say whether they have or haven't been cured yeah i think the discussion is much more is about really in some ways how people sabotage cure yeah that's, a, that's you know and then there's the people who that's another to, topic for a podcast yeah then there's the people who want to from their own script position uh leave therapy early yeah oh they think they might be cured whatever the cure is and we're having this discussion now and of course it's been behavioral cure rather than the real um transformational cure so i do think that the therapist needs to um discuss the process with the client and um go with where the client goes but i think there's there is something in the duty of care for the therapist to so give some of their own thoughts yeah and have that discussion yeah mm. i mean you must have had it yourself with clients about is it the right time to end? Um, am I sabotaging endings? Have I completed my contract or is the more? You must have had that conversation. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think for some clients, I felt like they're going over old ground again. Like they don't want to actually end. So they kind yeah. of go back and start. Yeah. And it's kind of like, you know, this is not what I would say to them, but it's kind of like, hang on a minute, we've we've been through this. We we've you know reached a conclusion with this. Why are we going back to that now? As if there's a fear of actually being out in the big wide world on their own. And often there and often there is. Yeah. There actually is. And which may, is where the uh, maintenance contract would come in really yeah, handy with people. Yeah, and it may yeah. or may not be the right time to end. Um, but I think it's very important in, in the sense of termination to have the discussion. Yeah. And maintenance contracts are very popular and they're very yeah. common where yeah. people may come back, you know, I don't know, four times a year or something like that. Yeah. And I, I think it's a good way of helping people re-enter, if you like, um, and integrate some of the changes they've made and still have some support. Yes, yeah. And I, th I think that's that's a really valid point is letting them, you know, 
try it out and, and see how it goes, you know, integrate their learning and the things that they've done and, and see how it pans out for them, knowing that you're still there mm. if they need it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot in that discussion, but I think that as time has gone more and more my career, um, I've liked that idea. Mm. So cure is a very big subject area. It is. Uh, but it's an important one to think about. And I say, Eric Byrne, I think, besides talking about different types of cure, symptomatic cure, transferential cure, psychoanalytical cure, he did also link cure to contracts. Yeah. And I mean, Steiner particularly, and I think also Byrne in his book, which is after the talks about cure can also be seen in terms of when the dysfunctional script has been let go of and the new script, the positive one, has you know started to be actioned or put on the road yeah and i think you you know talking about that with it being you know when the contract has been completed just to touch on it kind of shines a light on why it's so important that the contract is quite specific to start off with you know mm -hmm. often clients will come and when i say you know what do you want to get out of therapy they'll say i want to be happier well yeah. How do we know when you're happier? What What is it on a scale of one to ten? You know, so the, the contracts at the beginning need to be quite specific as to what they want to be able yeah. to achieve. Yeah. I think you agree more. And also observable. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. finishable. Yeah. Yeah. How will we know when we've achieved it? What, uh, you know, what, what will life be like for you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of our early, early podcasts, maybe six or seven, was contracts part one and followed up by contracts part two. Yeah. We talked all about this. I don't think we linked it to the idea of cure though. No. But it's certainly one way of looking at it. Yeah. I've really enjoyed that, Bob. Thank you. It's a very interesting, and I think it's also important for therapists to think about all this, particularly in a in this whole process about a bilateral discussion about when the therapist has finished it and whether it's linked to contracts or not yeah yeah Good. great so what we're going to be talking about in the next one um episode 91 is how do we deal with feelings in therapy oh one of my favorite subjects whether it's ours <laughs> or theirs or anybody's <laughs> i don't know whatever comes up i feel excited about this already oh good <laughs> stuff okie dokie bob until next time yeah thank you Speak to you soon. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.